All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Jorge. In honor of Latinx Heritage Month, the Political Science Club is proud to host Dr. Michael Parberg, in the, an assistant professor in the Political Science Department at Virginia Commonwealth University. He specializes in immigration, labor, and Latin American politics. Dr. Parberg is also an associate fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, DC, and a regular contributor for The Guardian. He has also written for the Washington Post, The New Republic, Slate, and other publications. He has appeared on and been interviewed in national and, inter and, national and international media, including Sky News, US News, and World Report, Bloomberg, Houston, Chronicle, Dallas Morning News, WGBH Boston, Pacifica Radio, RSI, and Talam. He has also served as an expert witness in legal cases involving Central American migration and security issues Today, he is joining us to talk about the state of Salvadorian politics and Bitcoin as the country's new legal tender. Jorge, back to you. Thanks, Diana. Again, uh, thank you all for joining us today. This is the talk that um, I have been wanting to bring to the club for a long time, primarily because as a Salvadorian myself, now living in the States, I try to follow what's happening in, in El Salvador. Um, and I came across Dr. Parbrick, who will be our guest today. Um, and uh, as I was doing research for this, sort of on a, on a light note, uh, one of the, my favorite things that I found out about him is that he speaks perfect Spanish. Um, I was watching some past interviews and he's talking politics in Spanish, which is always fun to do, at least for me and my friends, because we translate back and forth and all the terminology. And so I, I, I really like that. But um, I'm happy to have you all with us today, and I can I can thank you all for being here, uh, Dr. Parbrick. Go go ahead. Floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you so much, Diana and Jorge, for that uh, that very generous introduction. Um, it re really too generous. My Spanish is definitely not perfect, and I actually can't really do all that. The Salvadoran Spanish, like the Vos stuff, is not really something that is that familiar with me, even though I spent a lot of time uh, in country. So um, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me. Happy to talk about uh, uh, about my my work. Uh, so, if there's any part in uh, in my presentation, which is really supposed to be kind of an overview of current issues in uh, in El Salvador, Salvadoran politics, uh, I'm happy to go into uh, a little bit more more detail. I've got a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to uh, you know give. It's not. I'm, I'm trying not to make this a formal uh, talk, like an academic talk. It's meant to just be uh, you know in some ways a uh, a crutch for uh, for presentation, so I can remember remember what I have to say. But uh, but I will I will just go ahead and present and see how it goes, and then I guess we'll open it up to uh, to Q and A. Uh, so I'll just uh, let's see, open up the uh, PowerPoint now. Let's see. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you can you see that? Is that is that coming through? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So uh, the, the title I came up with um, is El Salvador Democratic Challenges in an Emerging One-Party State. Um, I, I say that because, I mean, there's a lot of ways that we can describe uh, the situation with the Bukele government. Um, you know, some people say, you know, authoritarian or um, and he himself just recently on Twitter uh, facetiously has referred to himself as a dictator. Um, I would say, you know, I think one party state is effectively uh, a more accurate and maybe slightly less charged way of describing it, being that, uh, uh, that the party effectively controls all three branches of government. Um, but uh, I, I wouldn't quite go so far as to say, you know, outright dictatorship. Um, you know, I, I do have worries personally about the direction that it is going, and I'll express this publicly. Um, they, the people in the Bukele government as allies uh, have have been critical of me. And so I think, you know, this is all fair game. You know, we're, we're all, we all are entitled to our opinions. Uh, let me just introduce myself and just to let you, uh, uh, let you all know, Oops, hold on, let's see. Yeah, so I am, uh, here's a picture of me in El Salvador with the world's largest pupusa. I am not Salvadoran myself. I'm not Latino myself, I'm Korean American. Um, so I'm, I'm coming to this perspective as an outsider and I wanna be very clear about that. Um, my interest in, in El Salvador, Central America generally came when I was a kid. I, I lived in Panama uh, for a number of years. That's where I learned my Spanish, interested in Central America generally. Um, and when I was doing my PhD, I decided to, to focus on El Salvador. It's just something that, it, it's a country that fascinated me, partly because I 
grew up in the Washington DC area, Northern Virginia. I now li- I'm in Richmond, Virginia now, so I didn't move very far. And uh, as many of you know, huge Salvadoran, well, huge Central American diaspora generally, but uh, but the largest group being South Salvadoran. So uh, the Washington DC area, particularly uh, Virginia would has the uh, uh, second largest uh, Salvadoran diaspora in the US after the lo- greater Los Angeles area. Other large areas include uh, uh, Houston, Texas, uh, Long Island, New York, but um, but Salvadorans, we'll talk about the, uh, the diaspora a little more. So this is actually the subject, that was mainly the subject of my, uh, my dissertation was transnational linkages uh, between El Salvador and uh, the Salvadoran diaspora, um, how, how Sal- the Salvadoran diaspora influences politics, but also drivers of migration. And obviously with, uh, with the current focus on so-called root causes of migration in the Biden administration, this is, uh, this is a topic that is of great interest. Uh, and El Salvador certainly commands, um, one might say, a disproportionate uh, share of interest uh, and attention, both by U.S. politicians and the media, uh, than maybe it has in the past. And unfortunately, this has a lot to do with some problems that have uh, have uh, have come up, uh, that have persisted for uh, for a number of years. Anyway, we'll talk about all this. My general focus uh, of research is on immigration and and security, so especially kind of security. Uh, causes of migration that relate to security issues such as gangs, uh, crime, conflict um, in Latin America broadly. So I don't just focus on Central America. I also did some work with the Organization of American States uh, just as a contractor. I was never an employee and I don't speak for the OAS, but uh, spent some time uh, in El Salvador with them as well as in Colombia. Um, And a lot of my research has focused especially on MS-13, the gang issue more broadly. Um, And I spent, uh, spent a lot of time primarily in two places in El Salvador, San Salvador, and San Miguel. San Miguel, as maybe many of you know, is, uh, is a small department uh, that the city of San Miguel is the third largest in the country. And it's a, a major uh, uh, city of origin for, for many Salvadorans in the United States. If you go to any place where there's a lot of Salvadorans, you'll probably come across, a, you know, like Comedor Migueleño or something like that. So a lot of people make references to San Miguel. It's a beautiful place. I, I, I like it a lot. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, and I, I maybe I didn't mention this. Uh, I, this is public, so I guess I don't really have to uh, uh, be careful, about, sensitive about this. But during the 2020 campaign, I was uh, Senator Bernie Sanders' chief Latin America advisor uh, for Latin America policy. I, I do try to interact with people on the Hill as well. I unofficially advise other members of Congress who are interested in Central America policy. That part is not quite as public, so I'll be a little bit vague about that uh, right now. Basically, anyone in on Capitol Hill who is interested in Central America and El Salvador in particular, I try to interact with and uh, and give advice to. I have my email there, uh, personal website with links to things I've written, Twitter, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, uh, free, feel free afterwards. Um, let's start with Nayib Bukele. President Bukele is the current president of El Salvador. Uh, he is a, you know, someone who is in the news a lot. He likes to be in the news. He's very good at getting himself in the news. And by the news, I don't just mean traditional media. I also mean social media, which he is very skilled at uh, at using. He is actually, I'm sorry, this is probably a little bit uh, old. He's no longer 39, he's 40. But anyway, a, a young kind of barely millennial, just like me, we're basically the same age. Um, so one of the geriatric, so-called geriatric millennial uh, uh, presidents. Um, he has, uh, he's a businessman uh, by background and he's kind of, uh, you know, he, he built himself as an outsider and, you know, he kind of is uh, in some ways, even though he was a wealthy, wealthy person uh, when he, uh, ran. So actually, when I was in El Salvador doing uh, doing research, I was living in this uh, neighborhood of San Salvador called Escalón. Escalón is uh, you know, it, it's a wealthy neighborhood in San Salvador, uh, close to the, uh, the presidential palace uh, where he currently lives. But actually, even before then, he um, he ran a Yamaha dealership, and it was like I lived right across the street from his Yamaha dealership. So I didn't, I, ne- I never got to know him personally. But you know, he was he was around. He was already the mayor at the time. He was you know he was clear, clearly a rising star. Um, and so I kind of feel like I've been following his career since uh, since local politics uh, days. And before he was mayor of San Salvador, he was mayor of Nuevo Cucatlan, which was you know close to uh, to San Salvador. Um, he is a, a if this is of interest to anyone, he is of Palestinian descent. There is a very large uh, Palestinian diaspora in Central America. Uh, so El Salvador, uh, Honduras, and Chile are the three countries that have the largest Palestinian. Uh, populations uh, in uh, San Salvador. Maybe this is a bit of a side, but I think it's 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 interesting. It'll kind of funny. Uh, when he was running for president, uh, you know, politics can get dirty. There was like some smear campaigns against him. 
Uh, one of these was the kind of thing that in a parallel to the Obama uh, uh, campaign, he was being, there were rumors of him being a secret Muslim and in a, uh, uh, in a country that is you know, overwhelmingly Christian. So about roughly, roughly speaking, half Catholic, half, half Protestant, evangelical, um, this could have been potentially, uh, I don't know, raise eyebrows. And you know, his father was the imam of the, uh, the San Salvador mosque. Um, he has been, for what it's worth, uh, seen going into mosques and other places and you know, uh, probably praying, but he, he's a self-declared Christian or, and or agnostic, kind of depending on how, uh, when, when he is asked. Uh, but anyway, there's a, there's a photo that, that got leaked by one of his, uh, his, uh, his opponents that said that uh, they had evidence of him in uh, what they called uh, a traditional Muslim clothing, whatever that means. Um, and it turned out to be uh, a picture of him dressed as a Jedi Knight uh, from Star Wars, from a Star Wars uh, costume party, complete with a lightsaber and everything. So anyway, um, he is, uh, he, he rules uh, very much as a kind of personalist populist. He is, he, I would say he is not ideological. He does not um, really, he, I mean, his, I, this is a controversial thing to say. His critics on the left say he's definitely a right-wing demagogue. His critics on the right say he is a leftist because he was originally allied with the FMLN, which is the, uh, the left-wing party. He was never really that committed to the FMLN's uh, 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 platform or ideology uh, or, you know, or even its, its images. He, would, he, he refused to use their logo or even their color scheme, which is red. He always he used light blue as his, his personal color, which is now the color of his, uh, his own party. Uh, he's, you know, he's basically someone who uh, his ideology is he wants to be president. He wants to remain president. I think that's, uh, that's essentially the, the extent of it. Um, his rule has been increasingly authoritarian. This is something that has worried me, um, worried a lot of people in El Salvador. Um, and yet his approval rating is really high. And so I have to say, when I'm critical of Bukele government, I recognize that my, my attitude is a minority attitude if I were in uh, El Salvador. His, his approval ratings have fluctuated, in, but, but consistently quite high. Um, at one point, it hit about 90%. It's less than that now. Uh, particularly with the Bitcoin law, which we'll talk about, but still he has a clear majority uh, of support. Um, and this is due to a number of uh, reasons, which I will discuss. Uh, one is his, uh, his approach to crime, uh, which is, um, uh, I, I think, a little bit obfuscated about uh, how exactly he's been dealing with. Uh, his, his also his handling of uh, the COVID situation, which uh, I would say, you know, is a little less problematic. I think it's been uh, generally seen as more successful than, than most neighboring countries. Um, and most of all, really anger at uh, the traditional parties uh, of El Salvador, primarily the two uh, parties that traded power over the last 30 years, ARENA and the FMLN. Um, and he, when he ran for president, uh, and I was there in 2019 when he did, uh, he won basically by not really having a platform at all. He didn't really say what he was going to do when he ran for president. He just said, uh, basically, the other two parties are corrupt, vote for me. And that was a compelling message because uh, I'll be honest, the other two parties are corrupt or at least they, they, they have a lot of corrupt figures in them um, and they have been slow to clean house. And so, uh, so Bukele rode a wave of popular of anger at those traditional parties. He, ha he originally ran with a uh, party called Ghana, which is um, a party associated with a now disgraced and jailed former president, Tony Saka, who is of the right. Um, and uh, and then he uh, created his own party called Nuevas Ideas, New, New Ideas, um, and now effectively controls all three branches of government, uh, both by election and by some rather undemocratic uh, means when it comes to the judicial branch, which we will, uh, which we will come to. But he has a clear majority in the Legislative Assembly, and this allows him to do pretty much uh, uh, whatever he wants. Uh, corruption is, uh, talk about a, a major issue in, uh, in El Salvador, you know, in, in Latin America as a whole. Um, I think that when people look from the outside and look at El Salvador and wonder, you know, like, wow, how could, how could this person who seems to be very authoritarian, seems very dictator, uh, seems to very, be very dictatorial, still maintain so much support? I think they don't really realize how, how hot an issue this is. Um, because a lot of things we see in, in the U.S., unfortunately, uh, just focus on kind of the gang issue, the crime issue, and it is an issue. But when I was in El Salvador and talking to people, it, 
really like corruption was the number one issue. Crime was maybe number three or four or something like that. Um, and it really was the issue that drove uh, Bukele's rise. And a lot of that has to do with just the fact that very high profile past presidents have been either credibly accused of or out or jailed uh, or at least arrested for corruption. There was a uh, uh, Tony Saka, who is in jail uh, now, although they, uh, they briefly read, let him out to testify against uh, against uh, past administrations. Um, and there does seem to be a, a de facto pact between Bukele and, uh, and Tony Saka. There's also Francisco Flores, who was, uh, who was arrested, uh, later went on the run as a fugitive uh, and died before he could be uh, sentenced. But he was uh, accused of embezzling uh, millions and millions of dollars in earthquake relief funds that were sent by Taiwan, which is just really uh, pretty awful. Um, and then there's uh, Mauricio Funes, who was the first uh, left-wing uh, president, or the first president uh, who was elected with the left-wing party. He was actually not a member of the party, but he ran as that party's candidate. Quite popular in his day. In many ways, he was kind of the first Bukele. Um, and, uh, and then later on got... Uh, charged with uh, a number of corruption uh, charges. He, um, among other things, he just, he had a whole bunch of houses, I think like one in every department uh, or state for like each of his mistresses. He's, uh, he's now in uh, a fugitive in uh, Nicaragua and, uh, and you know, refusing to, uh, to come back to, to face charges. Most recently, the government, uh, the Bukele government filed charges against Salvador Santos Seren, uh, these charges, in my opinion, uh, are a little bit shakier, and it sounds uh, it sounds like this may be, you know, a little bit more politically motivated. But who knows? You know, maybe maybe there'll be stronger evidence to uh, to come out. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the current corruption issues a little bit more. But basically, the corruption issue has not gone away, um, and despite President Bukele's uh, presentation of himself as a breath of fresh air and it's a new day, you know, new morning in El Salvador, corruption still remains um, a major issue within his government. Um, a lot of it has to do with procurement fraud um, and the a perennial issue, if you consider this corruption, is ongoing negotiations between the government and the gangs. Um, and this is something that every government does. Every government pretends it does not do, um, but everyone knows that it does. And uh, the current Bukele government has definitely negotiated, has reached a pact with, uh, with the gangs, with MS-13 in particular, doesn't admit it, even though it's been widely reported and everyone knows it's true. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, authoritarianism. There are a lot of issues uh, with the current uh, president. He has, this is the, I think it's, this might still be his Twitter profile. He just recently changed this like a day or so ago in which he says, you can see, el dictador más cool del mundo mundial, um, you know, the, the, the coolest dictator in the world. Um, he, he thinks he's being cute uh, here, but, you know, a lot of people do consider him to be a, a dictator or maybe, in my opinion, an aspiring uh, dictator. He, he's definitely quite happy to take uh, um you know, hardline approaches to uh, towards his opponents uh, or his critics. Uh, probably most uh, famously, most most the most photographed example of this was his military occupation of the Legislative Assembly uh, a little over a year ago, uh, in which he tried to force the Legislative Assembly, then controlled by his rivals. Later on, they were voted out, and his his party came in. But at the time, his rivals were blocking a bill that he wanted to uh, finance military, uh, and so he sent the military in to intimidate them. Um, and this is something that. Uh, Drew widespread condemnation. Uh, I I condemned this in the Washington Post uh, myself. Uh, got some pushback from the Bukele administration, but I mean, some of the pushback I got was, "We don't see what the big deal is." And you know, my attitude is, "Well, if you don't see what the big deal is, maybe uh, you know, maybe you should uh, talk to people who who don't agree with you all the time." Um, the uh, a lot of attacks on the press, uh, a lot of attacks on the opposition. Uh, there is a well known army of social media trolls that uh, that go after uh, his uh, his opponents or his critics uh, on social media, essentially hound them, try to get them off of uh, social media. It's well known that this is directed from within his own government. Uh, officials, Porfirio Chicas, uh, Christian Guevara, these are the directors of the troll center. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not it's not a secret. Um, there have been arrests of uh, government officials uh, from the traditional parties, the opposition parties, Arena on the right and FMLN on the on the left, uh, perhaps most hypocritically, they, there have been uh, prosecutions of uh, past governments, uh, officials of past governments for doing the same thing that the Bukele government is doing, which is negotiating uh, with the gangs. There was even, at the kind of height of this, 
uh, an assassination of two FMLN party officials at a campaign event, oddly enough, by apparently by bodyguards of, uh, of Bukele's health ministry, uh, which is under investigation for corruption or was until he shut down the corruption investigation. So all of this is very murky. Um, I don't think at this point it hasn't quite opened into opened up into you know an open dirty war or anything like that. Uh, but there is what uh, his critics have called a uh, a kind of campaign of hate. A lot of uh, the the speech that he and his his spokespeople and his his trolls give towards the opposition is really dehumanizing. It's not just talking about them and saying they're critics or they're wrong. It's like they are you know they're figures that are not where they respect, they're corrupt, they're agents, they're foreign agents, they are, you know, basically the kinds of incitements that would really, that could lead people to take uh, violent action. Um, he has also controversially denigrated the peace accords, uh, which uh, El Salvador was, had a civil war from 1980 to 1992, uh, ended in the Treaty of Chapultepec in 1992, uh, which uh, those of, I guess, those of us who, political scientists who study transitions from uh, uh, from conflict to post-war peace, uh, generally consider a great success. I think one thing that El Salvador should be very proud of uh, is that it's a model for uh, for for political party for armed actors converting themselves into political parties and contesting elections peacefully. Obviously, it wasn't perfect after the war, but there hasn't been an outbreak of war uh, since then. So, for Bukele to describe uh, what he did as quote, a farce, the uh, the peace accords is something that that was offensive to a lot of people who, uh, you know, on, on both sides of this war, who, uh, who shed blood uh, and, and eventually, you know, reached a peaceful uh, conclusion. Um, he has fired any and all obstacles to his rule. He fired the last attorney general, Raul Melara. Now, Melara, well, the attorneys general in El Salvador are not actually named directly by the president, they're named by the legislative assembly. So there was a brief moment in which Bukele was president, but the opposition controlled the legislative assembly. Uh, Melara was therefore uh, not beholden to the president and was investigating uh, his government for multiple corruption charges. Um, as soon as the new assembly came in, like literally the day that the new assembly came in, uh, they fired him uh, at, you know, at Bukele's request and also fired uh, the uh, justices of the uh, Sala de Constitucional, the Constitutional Court, which is a constituent court of the Supreme Court, but it is the highest court in, uh, in the country. Um, in addition to this, as a way to further consolidate control of the judicial branch, uh, the Legislative Assembly just recently passed a law that forced the retirement of any judge over the age of 60. Uh, this will effectively get rid of a third of all judges in the country, which will, who will now be replaced by people named by uh, Bukele. Uh, incidentally, the, the current, uh, so he was just recently um, declared to be uh, eligible to run for consecutive re-election. This is a clear violation of the Constitution. The Constitution expressively says that uh, that the presidents have one term and they cannot run for re-election consecutively. But the people who declared that he was open, that he was uh, eligible to run for re-election was the new constitutional court that he named. Um, he's also uh, uh, been exploring other constitutional changes. Uh, so far, the constitutional, the new constitution or the constitutional reforms have not been fully unveiled, but there is a working group uh, that is headed by his vice president, Felix Oyoa, uh, that has a number of things that would essentially, you know, consolidate power in uh, in present Bukele. Um, few a few issues I'm going to bring up here. Uh, one is uh, issues of uh, uh, military issues. So this is a picture of the uh, of the military as well as armed police who had uh, occupied the legislative assembly as a show of force uh, about a year ago. Uh, another troubling uh, thing is there's been an ongoing investigation of the massacre at El Mosote. This is the most famous war crime that happened during the Civil War, 1981. Uh, in which uh, about 900 civilians were uh, were murdered by the Ataclato Battalion, which was a U.S. trained uh, uh, army battalion, uh, and they, they, there's been evidence of kind of greater U.S. involvement, I'd, I'd say, than what the uh, the U.S. Uh, has admitted, uh, as well as just you know wanting victims' families, wanting uh, wanting to know everything about it, and wanting to know everyone who was responsible, not just the soldiers who actually did the did the killings. Uh, the president has tried to block this investigation. He has uh, blocked access to uh, military archives. Um, and then as part of this forced retirement of judges, I think it's not a coincidence that uh, they chose 60 as the retirement age because the prosecuting judge who is overseeing the investigation, uh, Judge Guzman, is 61. Uh, so he was uh, going to be effectively forced out of retirement. I, I, I 
mess that up here. I was supposed to say later, so, sort of reinstated, uh, or rather under extreme pressure by the U.S. Embassy, um, he was uh, told that he could stay on the case. Uh, however, he has, I think to his credit, uh, said, okay, but I'm not going to go back unless all the judges, unless uh, all the judges can remain. Basically, this that this law of forced retirement is uh, rescinded. This is still in the works, and this hasn't been resolved yet. But generally speaking, President Bukele has an, an alliance with the military. I think he sees the military effectively as, as his Praetorian guard, um, and uh, and you know wants to make sure that they are on his side. Uh, another, in my mind, troubling uh, development is. Uh, a, uh, an increasing turn towards militarized policing uh, with the military. And this, this is something that is not limited to El Salvador, not limited to President Bukele. You can see this throughout the region in which the military is being take, sent to uh, take on roles that, uh, uh, policing roles. Um, and this is something that militaries are not trained to do. Militaries are not trained to make arrests. Militaries are trained to, you know, to engage. Um, and this is, a, you know, this can lead to greater violence, you know, more, more violent confrontations. Um, but the military is more respected uh, in El Salvador than the police, as, as is the case in most of Latin America. Um, one Transparency International poll uh, found that over 80% of Salvadorans consider the police, the PNC, to be corrupt. And so uh, the idea is the military is more respected institution, have them replace the police uh, to do uh, policing. Maybe that will decrease the corruption, but maybe also it will allow the military's popularity to rub, up, rub off on politicians such as President Bukele. Um, corruption, as I alluded to, has not really gone away. It has not stopped being an issue here. Um, and this is something that I think has really, uh, it is an Achilles heel of the Bukele administration and uh, hasn't been talked about enough. Even though I give credit to the Salvadoran press, they have definitely been on, uh, on the case of continuing to investigate ongoing corruption. So uh, one major source of corruption, as is the case in many countries, is procurement fraud, uh, which has become even more of an issue under, uh, under COVID under the pandemic situation. There have been multiple very questionable contracts uh, over PPE purchases by the uh, Ministry of Health, but other procurement, uh, uh, questionable uh, procurements. So these are government contracts. I mean, uh, from the Treasury Department, Agriculture Department, um, uh, it's one legislator, Christian Guevara, who I referred to, uh, made, made a bundle off of his air conditioning business, uh, selling air conditioning to uh, air conditioners to government uh, agencies. Uh, most recently came out uh, just uh, days ago, uh, Osiris Luna, who's the head of the prison system, uh, uh, basically embezzled uh, over a million dollars of food uh, from the public health emergency program under COVID relief, sold it, uh, made a profit off of it. This is all, I'll say allegedly speaking, but this has been reported uh, in the press. Um, Luna is also a key figure here. He's pictured here um, uh, in overseeing the negotiations between the government and MS-13. Now, the pact with MS-13 and the gang, and the other major gang, Barrio de Tiocho. Um, the, the, the terms have not been made public because the government continues to deny that there is such a thing. Um, but, uh, but one example is, of this uh, pact is that the US government uh, demanded the extradition of a top MS-13 leader uh, whose street name is Blue, um, and the Bukele government uh, denied the extradition uh, request. So it seems to be no extradition is, uh, is one of the terms of, uh, of this deal. Um, generally speaking, when governments negotiate with the gangs, the deal is uh, for the gangs to tamp down on the violence um, and, you know, maybe also turn out votes for uh, uh, or at least give access in their neighborhoods to, uh, to campaigning politicians uh, in exchange for some kind of perks, especially perks for prison imprisoned uh, uh, leaders uh, of the gangs called the Rampla. In, in the case of MS-13 and these would be, I don't know, like playstations in prison, but also, you know, non-extradition. Uh, agreements. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of his cabinet members are have very questionable uh, ties. Uh, there's um, uh, a number. Of, some of them have been even named to a so-called Engel list. This is something that the U.S. State Department put together to uh, uh, largely to embarrass the uh, Bukele government. Has named number of officials, including uh, uh, Carolina Vecinos, who is the chief of cabinet uh, for the Bukele government, as as some of the top corrupt officials uh, in the country. Uh, Vecinos is also Coincidentally, we'll talk about this. The uh, the head of the company, the parent company of the Bitcoin wallet app that the uh, government has laid out. So this raises a number of concerns about what the Bitcoin app is really for. A um, number of uh, officials have connections to the largest money laundering rings in the country. Uh, Alba is a, uh, a branch of the Venezuelan state oil company, PDVSA. 
Uh, this is something that was under the uh, previous governments, but essentially functions to launder dirty money um, from, from the Venezuelan government, from whoever the Venezuelan government is doing business with, uh, probably you know, many criminal actors, uh, was beneficial to the government in power at the time uh, under the FMLN. But uh, a number of people connected to this, um, uh, particularly this guy named uh, Menino, who is a uh, uh, not part of the government, but uh, but is close to Bukele, uh, have been kind of helping a number of Bukele people be connected to this network. Uh, there's also uh, another network that is connected to a cousin of former President Tony Saka named Herbert Saka, uh, who is basically the cutout for the uh, so-called Texas cartel. Um, and a number of people connected to the former SOC administration, which I think it's not it's not controversial to say it was was quite uh, corrupt. The current attorney general, uh, the current security minister, who oversees the police, among other things. So this is this is problematic for uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the response to to these investigations, often I would say heroic investigations done by the by the press in the face of uh, a lot of government harassment, has been to shut them down. Um, not shut down the press, although they would like to do that, but shut down the investigations themselves. So. When uh, Bukele ran for president, he promised to create a new anti-corruption body called CCS, modeled after CC in Guatemala, which is, I think most people would say, the most effective anti-corruption body in, in Latin America and in, in, in modern history. Uh, CCS definitely did not have as strong of a mandate. It was set up what, by the OAS rather than by the UN. Uh, but uh, even that was, I think, uh, too independent for Bukele's taste when it began investigating his government, particularly the health ministry for those uh, uh, PPE procurement. Uh, issues. So he closed that down. Um, he fired uh, the uh, former attorney general. Um, and I'd say his his primary uh, strategy for distracting from for dealing with the corruption issues is distraction, uh, focusing on, uh, you know, whatever he can do. I, I mean, this Osiris Luna thing came out. And I think the whole thing about him calling himself a dictator happened soon after that. I think it's probably not a coincidence. Bitcoin, I think, served primarily as a massive distraction. It got a whole bunch of press uh, generate a whole bunch of anger, but uh, but it is something that you know does kind of steer, I think, attention away from these more fundamental issues of corruption within the government. The other thing he likes to do, and this is a page he's taken from Trump, is call all of his uh, his critics uh, agents of George Soros. Uh, he even uses the same term that uh, that Trump or uh, a lot of Trump's people like to use, globalists. Uh, so he he takes I don't know he takes his cues from, but he, he's very Trump like in in many of those uh, respects. Here's a picture of him. Uh, picture he put on his uh, his Twitter profile with the, the red eyes. This is a, a a Bitcoin reference. Bitcoin fans, Bitcoin bros, like to uh, to put uh, put red eyes on their on their profiles. Um, so the latest thing that's gotten the news a lot was uh, was the declaration by uh, by the government. This is a, a bill passed by the legislative assembly, but the legislative assembly is controlled by Bukele, uh, naming uh, Bitcoin legal tender. Uh, El Salvador uh, uses the dollar. As uh, as its uh, as its currency, uh, replacing a former uh, national currency, so effectively El Salvador doesn't have control over uh, over its uh, over its money supply. Um, Bitcoin was sold to uh, Fred Bukele by a number of people. Uh, Jack Mahler is probably the, uh, the 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 principal investor um, uh, who who's behind a a platform called Strike. Um, and have worked uh, with uh, with the Bukele government, um, and especially with uh, Bukele's brothers, who are who are kind of unofficial advisors, but have been directing a lot of policy, particularly including with the Bitcoin policy. Um, there, there was a pilot program in a beach uh, town called El Sonte, a surf a surf area called Bit so that uh, uh, unofficially people described as Bitcoin Beach. Incidentally, El Salvador has some of the best surfing in the world, uh, so don't think it's just all about whatever crime and corruption. Uh, Surfers know this, and you know they make pilgrimages to uh, uh, to El Salvador. Um, anyway, so there's a beach town called called El Sonte. They started using Bitcoin, uh, basically, you know. And when you declare something legal tender, you mean it means that every vendor, every seller has to accept Bitcoin for payment, whether they like it or not. And this was quite controversial. So, um, uh, so this is something that a lot of people didn't like, and um, I would say. Um, you know, it's it's something that it's had mixed the 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 uh, the, the rollout had okay the the Bitcoin Beach pilot program has had mixed reviews. Some people like it, a lot of people don't. A lot of vendors are resentful about having to accept this weird you know cryptocurrency they don't completely most people don't completely understand. But anyway, uh, they ran through this uh, uh, this new currency um, and they unveiled a new digital wallet, just an app 
uh, in which, and they loaded it, they preloaded it with, uh, with some funds if you, you know, if you were to sign up to incentivize people uh, to do that. They call it Chivo. Chivo is just Salvadoran slang for cool. So, you know, it goes along with President Bukele's, you know, cool image. Um, and, uh, and there's it generated a, ma a mass, uh, mass confusion. So on September 15th, last week, at the 200th anniversary of, you know, uh, of uh, Central America's independence from Spain. So congratulations. So, uh, you know, a great, uh, a great momentous uh, uh, anniversary. Um, tons and tons of people, I don't know the exact count, went out on the streets to protest this and protest the, the Bukele government especially, but really it was the, the Bitcoin thing was the thing that, uh, that, that sparked it. And a lot of people said they don't like this. A lot of people are worried about how it's going to actually work in practice. And you know, look, uh, El Salvador, like a lot of countries, is largely cash-based economy. Most people work in the informal sector. How is the average street vendor, you know, selling pupusas on the street, going to you know accept Bitcoin in for payment? Well, they're going to have to have the app. They're going to have to allow people to pay for it. Um, you know, it has a highly volatile value, even just within moments of uh, Bitcoin being adopted as legal tender, uh, the price or the, the value of it dropped uh, precipitously. So a lot of people worried about this. Um, so obviously people on the street would be, you know, regular people would be, if this goes bad, the greatest victims of it. However, I will say there's kind of bigger, there, there, there's bigger global actors who are concerned about this as well, most notably the IMF. Uh, El Salvador is currently in uh, negotiations with the IMF over a major loan. They're going badly right now. I don't know if they're actually going to happen uh, largely over, so partially over concerns about the procurement fraud, because a lot of that money that um, that was uh, went for like PPE purchases that ended up getting embezzled, uh, probably a lot of that came from the IMF. The IMF gave a bridge loan uh, previously over uh, uh, over uh, uh, COVID. But um, IMF is also concerned about the use of uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for money laundering because uh, Bitcoin uh, and other cryptocurrencies, they don't go through the banking system. They don't, don't go through the SWIFT system, international banking system of registering uh, bank transactions. Um, Bitcoin defenders will say, yes, but it is, you know, it is, there is a blockchain and there, you know, it, it is a ledger in which you can, you know, every transaction is registered in practice, extremely difficult to actually see those uh, those records and those transactions but in any case the fact that it goes outside the banking system is uh is the appeal both for remittances which is the the main way this has been sold people uh you know 25 percent of el salvador's uh gdp comes from remittances sent from salvadorans abroad and they pay fees to transfer that money through wire, tra wire transfers like uh like western union so uh so if they can do that through bitcoin you know uh they don't have to uh, they don't have to pay those fees. So that's, you know, uh, that, that's in the plus category. Um, but then there's also the question of uh, who else might be using this, uh, this Bitcoin? Uh, I mean, these, uh, these things to, to transfer money. And would, would this make El Salvador uh, kind of like my former home, Panama, with, you know, like the secret banks uh, and a major center of, uh, of money laundering. So we will, we will see that. Um, okay, hold on. Let's see. Uh, crime. So crime is a perennial issue, something we hear about a lot in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, this is a picture I took in the area I was in in San Miguel of uh, MS-13 uh, mural. Um, you know, this is uh, another picture of the uh, you know, famously overcrowded prisons. The prison system in El Salvador is at between 200 and 400 uh, percent capacity. Now, the murder rate has gone down. And it's something that uh, President Bukele has taken great credit for. Uh, it hit a peak when, when I was uh, first going there about 2015. Um, and, uh, and successive governments show they brave parents did not have a handle on the crime rate. They just uh, had successive versions of a, a policing program they called Mano Dura, which means literally hard hand, but think of it as you know, no, zero tolerance policing, you know, iron fist policing, uh, in which you just kind of um, set the police out, arrest as many people as possible, engage in extrajudicial uh, killings. There have been a number of uh, rogue units uh, that were found to have been engaging in extrajudicial killings of suspected gang members and their families. There were entire massacres under the Sanchez Seren administration. Uh, these things have continued, but they've been swept under the rug a little bit more. Uh, the crime rate, the murder rate in particular, has declined sharply under uh, Bukele. Um, he has taken credit for this with his uh, version of Mano Dura, which he calls the Territorial Control Plan. Um, it's really basically the same as Mano Dura, which makes everyone think, you know, I don't think this has been proven not to work in the past. Why? With this work now, well, it's not it's not his territorial control plan. It's pretty clearly it's the pact with the gangs, and this is something that is the only thing that's been shown to actually work in bringing down the crime rate when the government negotiates with the gangs. Now, I'm going to be opinionated here, and this is just my opinion. 
I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with negotiating with gangs. Um, I mean, we, the United States, negotiate with the Taliban, right? Um, I think that it's just the negotiations need to be more transparent. No one knows what the terms are. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it seems to be a, a nexus for a number of corrupt deals. Uh, so one of the, another reason why the, uh, the, the crime rate has gone down is the um, uh, COVID lockdowns. So just a lot of people are just not leaving for a long time. El Salvador had a very harsh uh, quarantine. Uh, but another thing, and this is not really talked about so much, is, uh, is numbers fudging. Um, so uh, disappearances don't count as murders uh, because uh, if you don't find a body, there's no crime. Uh, it has been shown the disappearance rate has been going up uh, at the same time the murder rate has been going, going down and actually doubled uh, in the past year, according to some figures. Now, obviously, it's very difficult to measure disappearances uh, because they're disappearances and not everyone reports them. And the Minister of Security has actually told people to please don't report disappearances, which is a bad sign. Um, but, uh, but essentially, it seems quite likely that uh, a part of this pact with the gangs is the government telling the gangs, you know, if you, you be better at hiding bodies and the police is not going to try as hard at, uh, at finding them. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of ways that you could fudge the numbers with, uh, uh, with, the, with the crime rate. Prison conditions remain quite abominable, um, and the, uh, the, the Bukele government has not really made apologies for this. They've actually trotted out. People showed them to uh, to the press, uh, you know, in half naked, mostly naked, uh, chained together, um, and kind of just advertising how, how difficult, how terrible the uh, conditions are. Uh, prisons uh, were have traditionally been segregated by gang because the two uh, gangs actually it's three now because Bobby de Siocho split into two factions. But anyway, the gangs essentially have a kill on site order for each other. So there would be like one gang for MS-13, one gang for uh, Bobby de Siocho, and one thing that Bukele said he was going to do was he said, I'm going to just put them all together in the same prisons and let them kill each other. And, you know, a lot of people in El Salvador said, good, let them kill each other. You know, we're fine with that. Um, that hasn't quite happened, mostly because of very harsh prison conditions and the, and the harsh lockdowns. But anyway, this is all to say crime is a very sensitive political issue and it's something that has international implications. This is a picture I took when I was there for a previous election. This is a, an ad for Arena, the right wing party, um, has a picture as you kind of see Salvador and family living in New York, there's a state Statue of Liberty in the background, um, and they're saying, uh, our remittances will not pay extortions. And it's kind of sending the message that like your family members in the US who pay, who send you money, who send your remittances, um, they might send you less if they think your remittances are gonna get stolen uh, by the gangs. And it is known that the gangs target people in El Salvador who, are, who they know have family members in the US because they know they receive money from the US. Uh, so this is a sensitive issue and uh, something that Bukele has been, you know, quite politically astute at uh, at addressing, uh, even though his means have been, uh, you know, a little bit less uh, less than transparent. Uh, civil society groups. I just kind of want to raise some of these. There's there's a number of groups that have been um, have maybe troubled relations with uh, with the Bukele government, media in particular. There's uh, both traditional media, the two uh, largest newspapers, uh, La Prensa Gráfica and Diario de Hoy but also newer media, online only media, uh, particularly El Faro and Factum, uh, which have uh, done some very, uh, all, of, all of these have done quite good investigative reporting into uh, some of these, especially corruption allegations into this government and, and, uh, and previous governments and have been attacked quite harshly, uh, called fake news, uh, called agents of Soros or whatever by the Bukele government. Uh, churches have traditionally been, uh, you know, mostly uh, exempt from uh, from government harassment. Um, the uh, another thing I think that's because I'm interested in gang issues. Uh, one of the really the most effective uh, institutions dealing with gangs have been churches, particularly the evangelical churches have a uh, have a program of gang exit in which they actually are able to help get people out of gangs through a highly regimented program, which they kind of watch them 24/7. Um, but however, even churches uh, have been there's been floated from the Bukele government ideas of maybe you know treating them as uh, uh, you know, as partisan actors, if they receive uh, funding from like the U.S., for example, for things like these gang exit programs, uh, groups that uh, that advocate on behalf of migrants or deportees, NGOs, uh, uh, foundations, particularly there's a really good foundation uh, called Fundación Cristo Sal that has been quite critical of the Bukele government, and uh, the, his proxies have suggested things like making them illegal or taking away their tax. Uh, tax exempt status. Uh, it, it's very similar to the approach that um, the Ortega government has taken towards uh, NGOs, kind of declaring them any enemies of the state in Nicaragua. Uh, businesses, uh, another, uh, another, I think, important actor in terms of dealing with the gang and crime situation have been certain businesses that 
uh, that offer employment to ex-convicts. Uh, it, it helped for uh, deportee reintegration, especially in uh, the apparel industry and the call center uh, industry. Um, but uh, some business owners have, who have been critical, prominent business leaders uh, who have been critical of the Bukele government have been harassed uh, quite harshly. Um, it's a case with uh, this guy who runs a donut chain called Mr. Donut, uh, which Salvadorans love. It's kind of like the way Canadians think of Tim Hortons or um, Philadelphians think of Wawa. Everyone loves Mr. Donut. But anyway, the, the owner, Mr. Donut, has been harassed uh, quite, quite harshly by the Bukele government for financing one of these media outlets, talk to him. Um, and, uh, and the government sent regulatory agencies after him, like you know, health, health, labor, uh, tax agencies to kind of, and this has been, and he ended up changing his tune. He ended up uh, kind of tamping down his criticism. And I think this is, uh, in my opinion, a, a scary precedent to set, which is that the government can essentially use regulatory agencies to harass uh, critics into silence. Um, so there's been a number of state threats, um, you know, investigations into his opponents, you know, declarations of fake news, um, and things like that. Um, diaspora is also a very important uh, player in this. There's roughly 2 million Salvadorans in the U.S. concentrated, especially in California, the D.C. area, Texas, and, uh, and New York. Uh, remittances account for between 20 and as much as 25 percent as fluctuates uh, of GDP, but, you know, a huge amount. And um, so obviously things that involve people in the diaspora, such as TPS, uh, become big, big issues in El Salvador. And people wonder, is, you know, is the U.S. government going to let TPS holders stay, or if, if they're going to be sent back, then we're going to lose our immenses from them. So this is a, a big issue. So they, they have a powerful voice in Salvadoran politics. Uh, the diaspora supported Bukele. There, there is uh, diaspora voting at the presidential level and actually just recently extended to the local level. Um, I say good for the Bukele government for doing that. I, I, I fully support enfranchising more people. Um, and, uh, and they voted very strongly for him. However, it looks like diaspora support has waned uh, uh, recently. So one example of this is diaspora groups uh, pushed to cut U.S. military aid to, uh, to El Salvador in the omnibus bill, um, something that was done uh, through the office of uh, Norma Torres, uh, who has been a major critic. She's a Guatemalan-American member of Congress, but a major critic of, uh, of President Bukele. Um, and certain kingmakers have broken with Bukele. This is a guy, he, not, he's not famous, but uh, he's a restaurant owner in, uh, in Washington, D.C., named Luis, Luis Reyes. Uh, he's, he's a kingmaker, and he has given his endorsement of an endorsement of the business community, the endorsement of the diaspora to other people, including Mauricio Funes when he was running. Um, he claimed that he was at one point offered the vice presidential spot uh, by the FMLN, by the uh, by the left. He uh, he endorsed Bukele, and when Bukele won, he took credit for this. Um, but he later broke with Bukele, and now he called Bukele a dictator. Uh, so you know these are it, it, it's difficult. To, no, there's no such thing as you know a, a, a poll of all Salvadorans in the diaspora. So it's difficult to outside of elections to gauge uh, support. But it seems that he is losing support in the diaspora, and it's something that could be uh, could be a critical uh, critical change in Salvadoran politics. U.S. policy. This is where I'm going to end it. Has been uh, uh, has been a little bit haphazard uh, towards El Salvador under Trump. We're just going to go back to Trump. But under Trump. Uh, Bukele had great relations with Trump. Uh, the, he, he had a press conference with him, uh, talked about how you know he, he sees Trump as, as you know as as very much like him. They both his his words were like we spend a lot of time on Twitter a lot. Um, you know where uh, he, you know he's he's a cool guy. I'm a cool guy. Um, he liked Trump mostly. I don't know if it's necessarily exactly an ideological affinity because, like I said, I don't think uh, Bukele has particular ide an ideology of any kind. Um, I think it's mostly that Trump was predictable. He, he, he had a very transactional approach towards every country. So despite the fact that he famously, notoriously called El Salvador a shithole country, he also made a deal with President Bukele and uh, the, with the safe third country deal. In fact, he enlisted all the different countries in, in Central America to try to block migration from each other uh, to the United States by forcing people to apply for asylum in each other's countries rather than the US and so end up being declared uh, illegal. But anyway, um, he made a he made a pact with Bukele, and Bukele saw Trump as a guy he could make a deal with, right? And they're both, you know, rich business people who came into politics as outsiders. You know, there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, they say it like it is, you know, a certain amount of uh, similarity between the two. Biden administration has come in and thrown Bukele for a loop. Uh, they, they made it very clear. Uh, the Biden administration said, you know, we don't, you know, we don't see this as a uh, a transactional relationship. We care about things like corruption and good governance. We consider those things to be root causes of migration. So they made it very clear that they're, they they consider migration to be the major thing they they're focused on. But they um, you know they, they they don't simply want to make an enforcement issue, even though you know events at the border recently may suggest otherwise. 
They also uh, are interested in promoting things like uh, anti-poverty, you know, anti-crime stuff, and you know, and rule of law and good governance. And so they're highly concerned with uh, with Bukele's authoritarian uh, leanings. Uh, so some of the things that the U.S. has done to try to put pressure on Bukele has been this this, this so-called Engel list of names of corrupt officials, visa restrictions, uh, so trying to stop people from the Salvadoran government who, who they believe to be corrupt or, or enabling authoritarian to you know, go on their shopping trips to Miami. And it seems like a, a kind of cheap thing to do, but the, these, these things matter. Not all the visa restrictions are going to be public, by the way. There's different types of visa restrictions. Not all of them get reported in the news. Just, so, uh, so there's stuff kind of going on behind the scenes as well. There's also been public statements, uh, statements in which they you know, try to uh, uh, you know, shore up the press. Uh, Juan Gonzalez, who is the uh, the primary, the national security advisor on Latin America for, for President Biden, uh, has spoken out, has given interviews in El Fado, has talked about how you know the U.S. wants to support independent media uh, in El Salvador in, in the face of attacks from the Salvadoran government, um, and uh, and and uh, has been harshly critical of the decision by the Salvadoran government uh, by by by. Bukele, or rather by his his allies, to declare him eligible to run for re-elections. Uh, this is something from the uh, the acting U.S. Uh, ambassador uh, uh, Jim Manes, who uh, who says here, you know, the U.S. government condemns the decision by the uh, the constitutional court to uh, allow uh, President Bukele to run for re-election. That's just my opinion, but I say the, these condemnations might be taken a little bit more seriously by Bukele if they didn't come just a couple of days after. Uh, the same U.S. Embassy uh, celebrated the delivery of, U of U.S. military equipment to uh, to El Salvador in, in the form of a number of, uh, of helicopters. So, um, so mixed messages here with continued U.S. military assistance. I personally have been a big proponent of cutting, uh, restricting U.S. Uh, security assistance to well to all the countries in the Northern Triangle. Um, I am personally, this is just a, as an aside, I'm supporting a, a bill that I've been working on. Uh, to uh, to extend the so-called Leahy laws uh, to give greater ex uh, congressional oversight uh, over security assistance uh, in cases of corruption. Uh, we'll see. I think this bill is going to come to the floor later this week. Um, and uh, and there is a promised uh, but much delayed uh, big aid package uh, to uh, to Central America, to the Northern Triangle, Central America. It'll be four billion dollars. This is something that would be a big payout to a number of governments. The U.S. government has said. The Biden administration has said uh, we don't want this to be. Uh, to go to the government, we see our allies as civil society and the people of Central America, not the governments. Uh, so we will see. Of course, as we, I think maybe you don't know, but you know, the vast majority of USAID money doesn't go to governments or even to directly to the people in those countries. They go to USAID contractors. Um, but uh, but there is a there is a interest in on Capitol Hill, especially for greater congressional oversight over money that's going to uh, what. Many people, myself included, considered to be maybe unreliable allies in uh, uh, in government. So uh, yeah, so that's it. I'm going to just uh, stop the share here.